Hey guys, it's time to start section three. And um, just like we did in section two, we broke it into two halves. We're probably gonna break section three into two halves as well. Um, we'll talk about the grasslands first, which there's like two or three different types of grasslands. And then after that, we'll talk about the others, the chaparral, the deserts, and the tundra. So we'll get to that in a second. So we'll break it into two, so there'll be a part A and a part B. Remember that as we're going through, you have a project due. As we talk about each of the um, biomes, you need to be filling this out and giving us good details, uh, at least three day details for each one. Okay? Do not take shortcuts on this one. Do a good job. And then um, when we talk about each one, you're going to be coloring them in on the map. Uh, remember that um, you don't have to print this paper. You can use your computer. You can pull this up on the computer and use the paint program or anything else. You know, like when you draw mustaches on people's faces or, you know, put thought bubbles or, you know, cat ears. When you draw on a picture, you can do that exact same thing to do this. Okay? So you don't have to print it and color it if you don't, want, if you don't have a printer available. All right? If you, even if you just don't want to, if you want to color on the computer, you can color straight on the computer. Um, so don't feel like not having a printer is going to mess you up any. All right, let's get started. Uh, like I said, we're going to start with the grasslands today, and there's several different types of grasslands. In climates that have less rainfall, now section two was talking about the forests, all right? You, it takes a lot of tree, a lot of water to grow trees. So if you don't have less rainfall and you can't grow a tree, you're going to get this idea. You're going to get savannas, grasslands, and chaparrales. Now, chaparral, that might be something brand new for you guys. All right, we'll get there. Don't worry about it. But that's how you say it. It's chap. It's not chap. The CH sounds like an SH. Chaparral. All right. So um, as even less rain falls in these biomes, they begin to change to desert and tundra. So you get a little bit of rain. Okay, not enough to grow a tree. Less rain than what it takes for a tree. Then you're going to move into savannas and grasslands and chaparrales. You get even less rain. You're going to turn into de desert and tundra. Um, as rain decreases in an area, the diversity of species also decreases, meaning how many different types of animals or plants that can live there. The less rain you have, the less options you have. The less rain you have, the less options you have. So if there's less rain, you're going to have less biodiversity. You're going to have less, less fewer types of animals and plants. But the number of individuals of each species present might still be very large. Okay, so just because you only have a few types of plants that can live in that area doesn't mean there's not a lot of plants. There might be a whole bunch of whatever it is that can live there. So you'll have fewer types of plants, but you can still have plenty of plants. You see what that means? You can have fewer types of animals, but you can still have plenty of animals. That's what that's telling you right there. All right, savannas is going to be the first one. Savannas is a type of grassland. You know what savannas are. Okay, but basically they're a type of grassland that lives near the equator. Okay, so it's a type of grassland. Savannas are plains full of grasses uh, and scattered trees and shrubs that are found in tropical and subtropical habitats. Like I said, tropical and subtropical means near the equator. Now look at this for a second right here, okay? Plains. It's not a huge deal, okay, but this... Plane. Plane is the plane that flies. Okay. P L A I N is the ground. Okay. The the grasslands. Okay. So savannas are plains full of grasses, scattered trees, uh, scattered trees and shrubs. So you can have a little bit of trees, a couple of trees, but not many. Remember, the whole point is we're getting less and less rain. They're found mainly in regions of dry climate, such as East Africa and Western India. We know that East Africa is the best place to get a savanna because we're used to seeing zebras and lions and giraffes. And this is what we're talking about. But also in India, they have savannas as well. And that's why you'll get the tigers and um, rhinos, stuff like that. Okay, so rhinos in India? Definitely tigers. Yeah, yeah, there's Indian rhinos. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so although the savannas receive little rain throughout the year, they do have a wet season and a dry season. Okay, that's how they can survive. Part of the year is wet, part of the year is dry. It's not just like deserts that you don't get any rain at all. So you have to have at least enough to get these small trees. Uh, many animals are only active during the wet season. Because we're near the equator, 
if you're near the equator and you're going to be that hot and you also don't have a lot of rain, there's not a lot of food around. So a lot of the animals are going to just chill out, hibernate, or just, you know, just try not to do very much at all during the dry season. If they're going to do anything like forage or mate or have babies and all the kind of active things that animals are going to do, they're going to save that to the wet season. Grass fires happen a lot, but they're not necessarily bad. The grass fires are going to help to restore nutrients to the soil during the dry season. That's, that grass gets all crinkled up and dry and hot, and you step on it and it crunches. It's that bad dry. All right, so lightning strikes and the whole place burns down. And yes, that is scary for the animals that are there. And yes, it can get out of control, like what happened in Australia and everywhere else. It, yes, it can get out of control very easily. But when nature is balanced, the grass fires help to return nutrients to the soil. The crazy out of control grass fires are because nature is unbalanced because of the stuff we're doing. But when it's balanced, grass fires are actually helpful. Here is our um, water, I mean rain and temperature, and our map. And I know this one is difficult for you to see, um, but if you go to our web, uh, go to the website and pull up section three book, this, it says student text. Pull up section three and you'll see much clearer pictures, or you can just go to the internet and Google where are the savannas. Okay, that works just fine too. All right, so the line here is the temperature. This red line is the temperature because it is crazy hot all the time. So temperature is about 20 degrees Celsius and you'll want to figure out what that is in Fahrenheit. All right, you'll want to look up Fahrenheit to figure out what 20 degrees is, but it's about 20 degrees all year long. Now looking down here on the blue, this is how much rain you get. If you'll notice, they get a lot of rain right here in April. See the A down there? These are the months. Okay, these, these are months down along this bottom. January, February, March, April, May. You can see that there. Um, so they get a lot of rain in April and again in a little bit in November. So these are the two rainy seasons and dry season. This would really suck because look, that's, that's July and August. It's already way hot in July and August. And to be that dry as well, that's why they have so many grass fighters. Let's see, let's see, let's see. What's next? Okay, these are the plants. See, I told you. Grass fires. All right, the plants of the savanna. Because most of the rain falls during the wet season, the plants have to be able to survive for prolonged periods without water. They're only going to get water during April and November. The rest of the time, they're going to have to learn how to deal without. So some plants have large horizontal root systems to help them survive the dry seasons. That means they spread their, their root systems out like this way off to the side so they can make use of any water that might be possibly showing up anywhere. They are also able to, um, the roots are also able to enable the plant to grow quickly after a fire because if the whole roots, think about grasses, like when you pull up Johnson grass out of the yard and it has that pop, 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 pop things where it has roots going all the way over that way. All right, so if there's fire on this half, you still have roots of the same plant over here and they can do fine. And that way, if this one is growing fine, once the fire's over, they can send nutrients back on this side and this one can regrow. The grasses are also gonna have coarse vertical leaves to expose less surface area to help conserve water. All right, so coarse vertical leaves. Have you seen the plants that look like, they look like spikes poking up, but the plants stick up like this, straight up. Most, some plants, plants that live near a lot of water, their leaves are kind of flat like this to catch sunlight and catch water. Okay, but desert plants and drier savanna plants, they're gonna have leaves that stand straight up and are usually sharp and pokey, okay, because they don't want anybody to eat them. But the fact that they poke, they, the leaves stand upright rather than laying flat like most of the others means that when the sun comes down, Okay, it's only going to hit the top because that sun there is crazy hot and you don't want to cook the plants. You don't want them to be over hot and you don't want them to start evaporating all of the water that they work so hard to get. So if they have a leaf like this and the sun hits it, okay, the sun is hitting all over the place. Okay, heating up that plant crazy. It's losing its water. It's drying out. But if the leaf is like this upright, when the sun hits it, okay, it only hits the very top. 
and that way the plant is able to hold hold on to more of its water because less surface area look at that less surface area is exposed to the sun as opposed to when they're like this you have all of this surface area here is being hit with the sun okay but you have leaves that stand up like this only this much surface area is being hit by the sun some other plants are going to shed their leaves during the dry season so whereas the plants here shed their leaves in the fall getting ready for winter some of the the plants in the savannas are going to shed their leaves getting ready for the dry season so it'll look like fall but it's not it's crazy hot that's why they shed their leaves almost all of the plants that are out there have thorns to protect them from herbivores herbivores of course are animals that eat plants and they are hungry and the plants are working really hard to grow in that crazy heat and that crazy dry so yeah they don't want the animals to eat up their leaves so they've grown thorns all over the place so that some of them are so bad that the animals have to adapt very carefully like um, giraffes have a great big long uh, tongue that can work around the thorns to get the leaves if you don't have that adaptation you're not getting there you're not getting those leaves because the plants are like protecting themselves with those thorns the grazing herbivores like the elephant have adopted migratory ways of life if it's going to be wet in some one part of the year and dry in the other parts of the year you're going to have to walk around a lot to find your water okay they follow the rains to the areas where the new grass and the fresh watering holes the predators are going to be following right behind them okay because that's lunch walking around there they got to follow them many savannah animals give birth only during the rainy season when the food is abundant and the young are more likely to survive so over time they have evolved to only have their babies when it's just about rainy season and that way there's plenty of fresh grass for the new babies and they have time enough to learn and run and get bigger before the dry season comes to try to kill them some of the species of herbivores reduce competition for the food by eating vegetation at different heights than other species do so you've seen pictures of the african savanna where there's whole bunches of different types of animals all over the place you've got giraffes you've got elephants you've got zebras you've got wildebeest you've got antelopes you've got all of those animals and they are all herbivores so you would think that if they were all eating the exact same pieces of the grass they would fight they would compete and a lot of them would go hungry but you've seen how big those herds can get the way that those herds get so big is they share okay it's called resource partitioning different animals eat different parts of the plant and therefore they can all have a little bit now these are the temperate grasslands okay so we just finished savannas and they're near the equator do you remember that temperate means in the middle temperate means in the middle so you have the equator down here okay you have temperate going up and down on the world in the middle areas and then after that you have the polar regions tropical temperate polar so temperate means in the middle the temperate grasslands are the communities or biomes that are dominated by grasses have very few trees and are characterized by hot summers and very cold winters with rainfall that is intermediate between a forest and a desert that was a big paragraph full of a lot of words you ready let's take it apart okay so temperate grasslands are dominated by grasses obviously they're grasslands when we're talking about temperate grasslands i want you to think in your head prairies okay prairies with the buffalo the prairie dogs you know the wagons um, the native americans when they used to live there prairies okay that's what we call our temperate grasslands okay so um so they have very few trees um, very hot summers i mean not like hot like a desert not like hot like a jungle but i mean you know like we have this is us okay this is our we live in a deciduous forest but it's the same temperature as us all right so um 80 90 100 in the summertime going down to like in these places the prairies have crazy cold winters down to like negative 30 negative 40 sometimes that's extreme but more uh, definitely negative 20 
is kind of standard. So hot summers like us, 80, 90, 80 or 90 degrees in the summertime, going down to like negative 20 um, in the wintertime. And rainfall is intermediate. I mean, intermediate means in the middle. Intermediate means in the middle. In between what you're going to get from a forest and a desert. They have the most fertile soil of any biome. Now that is an incredibly important detail. All right, remember the details, got to fill in the details. But the temperate grasslands are the most fertile biome, and I'm going to explain why, because it makes a big difference to what we're doing to the world right now, okay? So we got all this grass, okay? Hot summers, the grass is growing good and strong, okay? Very cold winters, which means a lot of snow. Now what happens is, because there's a lot of snow in the wintertime, the snow sits there and lays on top of that grass. And because it's snow, it's too cold for the grass to decompose. So it just sits there and gets brown and gooky. Do, have you ever had, you guys probably haven't done it, but I have, when I get flowers, I am so proud to have flowers, you know, a vase of flowers, that I leave them on my table for a little bit too long. Okay, I've done it more than once, same to say. Okay, you guys, I'm sure, have never done that. But if you leave a bouquet of flowers sitting on your table for a little bit too long, and when you pick up those flowers to throw it away, there's brown gooky stuff where, and it stinks too, where the flowers have started to digest or uh, decompose. Now, think about that, okay? Then think about a whole prairie full of grass, okay? And the winter snow sitting on top of that grass all winter long and the grass can't decompose. It's just sitting there turning to gook. Okay, now for us, gook is gross, but that gook is full of nutrients. Okay, lots and lots of nutrients. Fertilizer, the stuff that's gonna make, when the snow finally melts, that brown gook starts to decompose and now, as the new spring grasses are coming up, it's like instant fertilizer. It's amazing, okay? Because that snow holds the, la the previous year's grasses, keeps it from decomposing until springtime when that new grass is just ready for breakfast, okay? So the temp temperate grasslands have the most fertile soil of any biome. And that's why here in the US, we call our prairies the breadbasket. Have you ever heard that in your history class? Our prairies are called the breadbasket because the land is so fertile, this is where we grow most of our crops for the whole nation. A, a few of the natural temperate grasslands, okay, this is what, very few natural grasslands remain because, like I said, this is such rich soil. We, they've been replaced by grazing areas for the animals, farms for growing crops like corn, soybeans, and wheat. Okay, so because this land is so fertile, like I explained, there are very few of them left. We've turned almost all of the grasslands into farms, okay? Which the trouble with that is the grasses, I think we're gonna get to it, the grasses root structure is so strong and so powerful that it holds the soil together. Corn and soybean and wheat, they don't have a very good root structure and the soil starts to get messed up. Okay, so we'll talk about that, I think, in a little bit. All right, so like I said, when we talked about savannas, there's always gonna be fires here. All right, let's talk, let's see what's next. The temperate grasslands are located on the interior of continents where there's too little rain for trees and includes the prairies of North America. So if you have a picture of a continent, whether it's the United States or China or Russia or any Australia, Anywhere that you have a continent, the grasslands are gonna be in the middle, okay? In the very center of the continents, okay? And that has to do with the, the oceans on either side and the, the mountains. And we'll talk about that, I think, in a little bit too. And again, when we talk about temperate grasslands, temperate means in the middle of the world, I mean, uh, in the middle area. So you've got the equator here in the very center, that's tropics. The equator is the tropics, and then going up and down, these are the temperate areas, and then going up and down again, those are the polar areas. So we're talking the temperate areas, both on the north hemisphere and on the southern, the northern and southern hemisphere. 
They both of them. So up here on the northern hemisphere where we live, we call them prairies. The grasslands in the southern hemisphere are called pampas. I think we might cover that in a second. Pampas, you know. I don't type really well. Pampas. That's what you call the grasslands in the southern hemisphere. All right, so the mountains are going to play a crucial role in maintaining the grasslands as the wet from the winds from the west are blocked. That's what I was trying to say in a minute a minute ago. The reason that the um, grasslands are in the interior of continents, if uh, let's see which way you guys are looking at it. So I guess if you're looking at it here, this would be hard. It's, it's hard for me to tell with the computer backwards. But let's say this is west and this is east. OK, I might be pointing backwards. Just forgive me. All right. But let's say this is west and this is east. All right. So on the west side of most continents, there is a huge uh, mountain range. Almost all in the northern hemisphere, almost every one of them has a big mountain range on the west side. The rain comes off of the ocean, rises up the mountain, cools, rains out its water, comes back down across the mountains, and then it's lost its water and it's dry. So the rain coming up the mountains loses its water and then comes back down the other side dry. And so because it's coming back down the other side dry, that's why on the interiors of continents, you have these grasslands. The, the wind dried out. It rained out all of its rain at the mountains. And so there's not much left to grow trees here on this side. The rainfall will increase as you keep going this way. That's why in our areas, like I said, where are we at? If this is west and this is east, again, we might be backwards. All right, so as the as the rain continues this way, when we are over here and we're not in grasslands, we're in forest. And so it increases as you get back to the further east. And you get taller and taller grasses to go as you as you get further. And then as you get even taller, you're going to get trees. The heavy precipitation is rare in the grasslands, but you're not going to get a lot of rain allowing the hot temperature in the summer to make the grasslands susceptible to fire. Okay, just like we were talking about savanna, um, during their dry season and during our summer, there's not a lot of rain, so there's a lot of fire. Here's our map. Um, and again, we have the temperature here. All right, so um, during the wintertime, it's right around zero Celsius. And then in this, which I'm, I know that one is 32. You know that one. So right around zero Celsius. Um, and then up here in the summertime, we're closer to. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading it backwards. About 35 degrees um, Celsius. So whatever 35 degrees Celsius is for the summertime. All right. And then the rain. Again, there's not a lot of it, but you're going to get most of it during the springtime, okay, April, May, and June, and then less in the wintertime because it's too cold to rain. Oh, and the map. You saw the map. All right, and again, if you can't see the map that's in the, um, if you can't see the map that's here on our website, go to the book, and if that's not good, just go to the internet, find out locations of temperate grasslands. You can get, you can get this done. Please give me a good one. Okay, give me a good one. It's a project grade. The root system of the prairie grass form the dense layers. Uh, the root system forms dense layers to survive the drought and fire. Remember, I said the root system of the natural grasses there is very strong, okay, and it's going to allow the plants to come back year after year, even if there's been a fire or even if there's been a drought. That's the natural grasses on the prairies. Now, with the corn and the wheat and the soybeans that we've put in there, they don't have that strong root system, and um, they don't protect the soil like the grasses do. The natural grasses do and they can't come back year after year like the natural grasses can. Very few trees are going to survive in the grassland because of that lack of rainfall, because of the fire, and because of constant winds. Okay, it's very windy on the prairie. And the trees, if, if you have a baby little sapling trying to grow, okay, all right, if, if the lack of rain doesn't kill it, then the fires might kill it. And if that, what happened? I am so sorry. Siri thought I'd been talking the whole time I was doing my lesson. Siri thought I was talking to her. 
crazy. All right, so this so if a baby sapling tree is trying to go grow, okay, the fires might get it, the the lack of rainfall might get it, or the the wind is going to get it, one or the other. Okay, the wind is going to blow it right over before it can try to grow. So the trees aren't going to survive. The amount of rainfall in the area is going to determine what type of plants are going to grow there. Obviously, think about it again. The amount of rainfall is going to determine what plants grow there, and then the type of plants that grow there is going to determine what animals grow there. All right. Now the the different plants are going to have varying root depth and grass height. Okay. So I think I've got a picture for that on the next slide. Yes, I do. All right. All right. So this is a short grass prairie. They get almost no rain. This is this is this is very close to desert level. OK, 25 centimeters of rain per year. Very close to desert level. So the roots are not very deep and the grass is not very tall. If you call the, if this is like the west side and this is the east side. OK, as you move further east, they get taller. All right. So. Um, when you get about 50 centimeters of rain per year, okay, you get a little bit longer roots and a little bit taller grasses, and then up to 88 centimeters per year, a lot longer roots and a lot taller grasses. And then the very next step after this okay, is the forest. Once you get past about 88 centimeters per year, then you have enough rain to grow trees. So once you get past there, then you're ready to hit the forest again. Nope. Yes. The animals who lived here. All right. Now, remember, I said the temperate grasslands around here where we are are called prairies, right? Yeah, I don't write very well. Prairies. I don't spell good either, guys. Give me a break. OK, so the grasslands where we live are called prairies. In South America, they're called pampas. I think that's a South American animal. Okay. Some of the grazing animals, such as bison and pronghorn antelope. No, that's one of ours. No, uh -uh. pronghorn lives in the prairies, too. That's North America. All right. So it's just it's so rare. Our, now, why don't we have prairies anymore? Let me figure out what I'm talking about. OK. When I saw this pronghorn antelope, I thought it was a South American antelope, okay? Um, but I forgot. Pronghorns are native to here, but almost none of us know this. I'm a science teacher, and I'd forgotten that pronghorn antelope are native to here um, because all of our prairies are dead, okay? And so we have so few, they're not, all right, let me focus. We are going to we are going to stop the video right here at the end of the temperate grasslands because it is getting kind of long. But what I'm trying to say is the prairies aren't dead. They are no longer natural. They are no longer natural. We've we've plowed all the prairies over and turned them into farms. So the fact that pronghorn antelopes used to live here all the time and we forgot shows you that almost none of our prairies are natural anymore. OK, but. The animals who do live here, the natural animals, are going to have, like the bison and the pronghorn antelope, are going to have large flat teeth for chewing up those grasses, okay? As well as the animals of the savanna, the, the herbivores of the savanna would also have that. Other grassland animals, like prairie dogs, owls, and badgers, are going to live underground burrows that protect them from predator on the open grasslands. So a lot of the um, animals that live there are going to be burrowing animals because there's no trees to hide behind, okay? There's no hiding places out there. So a lot of them are going to be burrowing animals. Now, the threats to the grassland, which I already covered some of them. All right, farming and overgrazing is the main thing. They've completely changed the, the grasslands altogether. They are no longer what they used to be because of farming and overgrazing. The grain crops, the stuff that we grow, corn, soybean, wheat, all the stuff that we've put in there can't hold the soil in place as well as the native grasses because the roots of the crop are shallow and soil erosion is going to eventually occur. Like I, like, like I talked about before, the grasses have very strong root systems and they are designed to live there. With all of that wind all the time, our corn, our wheat, our soybeans, the roots are so shallow 
that the soil blows away. That top layer of soil where all of the nutrients are blows away. Do you remember learning about the Dust Bowl in the 30s, right around the Great Depression? Okay, you were supposed to learn about it in history class, not, my, not me. Ask your history teacher. But the Dust Bowl that happened right around the 30s, the reason, that, the reason they called it the Dust Bowl is that we had been growing corn and wheat and other things in our prairies and not taking good care of the soil. And all of that topsoil blew away. They had humongous dust storms and the ground was useless. So right around the time we had the Great Depression, we were also having famines because we weren't using good farming practices. And that added to it. So soil erosion is one of the, one of the reasons for the Great Depression, because we had we had been using poor crop habits because the grain crops we use, okay, won't hold on to the soil. Erosion also caused the grass or erosion is also caused as the grasses are constantly eaten and trampled. Now in native native when the world is natural, the grass can recover and that's not going to be a huge deal. But if we start piling too many cows onto the onto the too many cows and pigs and stuff onto that they're not evolved to live in the grasslands the constant use can change the fruitful grasslands into desert-like biomes like i said the dust bowl dust bowl that blew all the good stuff away uh, chaparral this is where we'll we'll cut off for today and then we'll pick this up a little later okay i'll talk to you another time bye guys